Welcome to LaGrange First Church of God. This is our weekly podcast. Thanks for tuning in. If God's going to do something big in your life, there's a process He's going to take you through to do it. And so you start to see last week, Pastor Nate Tabman was here, and he talked about the conversion or, or the encounter Saul had with Paul. If you didn't know Saul, basically he was a religious man who hated Christians and tried to kill them. He has a, bam, conversion as he's driving down, and he's going to Damascus to get all these Christians. God blinds him, sends him to a, guy, uh, to a house, and tells this guy Ananias to come pray over him. He was blind, he could see, and that's where we are today. Okay, in chapter 9, verses 19. That's, that's been the story. We're seeing Paul, who's about to, or Saul, about to break out. And that's going to be significant for us today. This is, a, this is a passage that really resonated with me, and it resonated with me for a reason. I'm going to show you something right now, okay? If you're a visitor, I'll explain. If not, I'm just going to show you. Watch this. Okay, just so you know... I've had two spine surgeries and two soldier surgeries over the last uh, 16 months. All right, so uh, I have gone to physical therapy. I'm just going to tell you something right now. Spinal fusions hurt. Shoulders are always worse. I just want to tell you that, okay? I was ecstatic. Like, I wanted a, a diploma for graduating from physical therapy, okay? Like, I'm not quite ready to, you know, hit the links or anything like that, but it goes up and it goes down and sometimes it can go all around. So we're getting there and, and it hurts. Anybody done physical therapy after a surgery before? It hurts, right? They're there to ruin your life. And so <laughs> that's their job. Uh, actually, I had great physical therapists, but what had happened was, is after that, I felt like I was going to break out. I felt like I was going to break out. See, this dark cloud, anybody in this room who knows me, and it'll be four years, in seven days, I'll have been here four years, and anybody in this room knows me knows this, there's been a dark cloud over me for about 15 months. I mean, it's almost evil. My wife talked to my wife about it. I talked to the staff about it. It just has reigned over me. And a huge piece of that has been my health. See, if you don't know, I've had, I have the back says my surgeon of a 70-year-old, and, and I've done every treatment for 20 years to keep my back going, and finally I couldn't do it anymore. It just it couldn't help. I tried, you know, praying for miracles. I, I, I chiropractic. I tried shots. I tried everything, and finally I just couldn't do it anymore, and uh, the choice was to fuse the whole lumbar or just a disc. I went conservatively and tried the, just one disc, and at one point, and then at some point in my life, I'm going to have to fuse the entire lumbar. That's the bottom part of your spine, okay? And so we go in, and I remember I, Dr. Sharp's my doctor, and, and I was going in there. And we, I had to do this prep thing with my family doctor before I went to the surgery, and, and, she's, and we were sitting there, we are talking about how my health had really gotten together since I've been here, you know? I had lost almost 40 pounds. I mean, I, I was feeling good. I was ready to get in there. I'm like, and we're going to fix my back. And we even high-fived. Said a little prayer. I go to the surgery, get it done, get home. And my, 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 the inside of my foot is just on fire. There's pain, but on the left side, it's intensely worse. How do you call the doctor? I'm like, dude, I got a problem. This hurts. He's like, no, that's normal. I call every day. Something's right. Something's not right. Something's not right. Something's not right. And then they're the doctor, so they say, what's up? Well, guess what? They messed up a nerve. I was right. You're wrong. So instead of them like giving me something, they, they put me back down on a table, and then they split my back open, and they did another surgery, and that didn't work. And then I sat around basically for about five, six months, laid around, didn't exercise, didn't do anything, got fat, glad I saved my fat clothes, got fat, okay, and decided that I was going to start going around, walking around, and I joined a gym. And I would start going to the gym, and I'd start getting to the gym, I'd start getting my medium-sized clothes, and things were getting better. And one day, on a Sunday morning, I'm there all alone, prepping for the message, sitting in my head, and I go to pick up this weight, and I go, and I felt this electricity literally shoot through here into my shoulders. And I couldn't breathe. I mean, it was bad, and I was all alone. And you guys would have come, and I wasn't here. And what I did was, I had ripped my shoulders, the labrums out, and on this one, the tendon came off, 
And on this one, it detached from the soft skin. The labrum was gone. There was something other I can't remember. And so sometimes it's like, which shoulder you do first? So remember, I got through two spine surgeries. Now I'm also going to say some personal stuff in between this, okay? And I want you to hear what I have to say because I'm going to be very open with you to tell you about the process of life I was in. Not only during that time am I constantly worried as a former drug addict that I'm having to take these pain medicines because you've got to take it. You just... In my position, you had to take it, and I'm, I'm always worried about it. And I, I had family and friends that would help me take care of it, but it was bad. I mean, it hurt, and I don't want it, and it was just this whole deal. Well, in the process of that, I felt good enough one day that Kristen and I got pregnant. And um, we got pregnant. We didn't know what to do, and to be honest with you, we got a little worried, and we're like, we're old. It's not like Abraham and Sarah, but, you know, like, oh, and Corbin, you know, I'm convinced is going to join Al-Qaeda or something. <laughs> like, I, I just... I just keep moving. And, you know, we're going through this, and you've got that guilt in your heart where you're like, oh, we, you know, it's a baby, and his creation is by God. And we used to we struggle with infertility so long. We, we talked through it. We kind of got to the part. We bought a new car to put kids in. We did all these things. We lost the baby. And then during that time, I had friends uh, that I met in this fellowship that I got close to. And you know what? They left, and they didn't even tell me why. Close people. I had other things. I had Sarah, who was my right-hand person, one of the smartest people I know, Pastor Sarah. God called her out. After I introduced her to business school, she went and took off. I'll never do that again. All right? <laughs> and then you throw in the shoulders. And this season has been dark. It's heavy. It hurts physically. It hurt spiritually. It was a lot. It was a lot. It was one of the longest processes I've ever been through. And so now you know my excitement when I graduate physical therapy. And I walked out of there, and I'm like, I did it. And I, what did I do? I broke out. I broke out. And I'm telling you guys, seriously, I like started praising. I had a, a good talk with Kristen on Friday. I'm like, baby, I know I haven't been right, but, but, but this is good and things are going to get better. And, and, and then all of a sudden I get a message from her from my spine doctor. See, I know I have to have another spine surgery because the first one didn't work. And all of a sudden they have my MRI and they're saying, you got to come in. So I went right from this, praising God and breaking out. And then all of a sudden I feel like, What's going to happen? A dark season is about to begin. Or did it ever begin? Did it ever end? Now, that's why I resonate with this passage with Paul. Because I believe, even now, I choose to praise God in those moments. I picked that passage that Pastor Nathan shared. I picked those because here's what I know. I've got to trust the process. That's what the Lord put on my heart, is to trust the process, which is what we're going to talk about in there. Yeah, every bad thing I've been through in my walk with Christ, you know what it's done? It's made me stronger and drawn me closer to him. I may fall along the way, but by the spirit and the grace of God, I become closer and closer and closer. It's just my attitude that chooses to look at it and see God's glory through it, or I sit and pout until he smacks me down and I wake up and go, wow, that was a blessing. And so I've choose to call that season, it's going to be a blessing, because here's what I know. God works all things for good to those who are called according to his will and purpose, and I know I'm called. And I know right now, you wouldn't be here unless God called you. You wouldn't be here. Now, you may have chosen to be here. You listened to the call, or somebody called you and annoyed you and got you here. But you chose. You made that decision. And you made that decision as you too are going through some processes in your life. You do not know how to intellectually process. There are things that are going on in your spirit and you probably are wondering, why is this going on? And I'm here to tell you, when I look at Paul, when, or they still call him Saul in this passage. Don't get all tweaky on me, okay? Paul saw the same guy, okay? When I look at him in this process, I see something. I see something that gave me hope when I needed it. And I know a lot of you, as your shepherd, 
are carrying some heavy things right now. Or you're going back and forth, you're vacillating, and you're home, you don't know where your heart is. And you don't want it to be angry, you don't want it to be cynical, you don't want bad things to happen, you don't want to look around the corner all the time. Some of you may be hurting, some of you physically, emotionally, spiritually. And you're going through this thing, and I'm here one more time to show you and tell you, trust the process. That is a word the Lord gave me to show you today. Now, how do you do that? Well, let's go back to Saul in this story. We know he's just been converted. We know he's uh, received the Holy Spirit. He's up. And so what does he do next in this narrative? I want you to show something, okay? If you want to learn to trust the process, you have to learn to tell your story. You have to learn to tell your message. Now, you're not going to know your message right off the bat, but you're going to learn your message in the process. You're going to learn what God's doing in your heart to go along and share. If you choose to do that, you will see God do some amazing things. If you trust in this process, trust in this. Trust in your message, because all of us have a different message. Now, I'm going to skip. I'm just skipping ahead. Don't go there, okay? To Acts uh, 26. Now, you won't find it in Acts 9 where God intervenes with Saul. You won't find it, okay? But in Acts 26, so all these chapters later, Paul reveals something that God said to him when he was knocked down and encountered with the risen Jesus Christ. He said, this is, he's saying, this is what Jesus said. And then I asked, who are you, Lord? So when he's getting knocked down, he said, who are you, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom you are persecuting. The Lord replied, now get up and stand on your feet. I have appeared to you to appoint you as a servant and as a witness of what you have seen and will see of me. I rescue you from your own people and from the Gentiles. Everybody say Gentiles. I'm sending you to them. Okay, this is important. I'm sending you to them to open their eyes. Say, open their eyes. <laughs> Are you at church? Say, open your eyes. Open your eyes. All right, there we go. Open, your, open their eyes to turn them from darkness to light and from power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and place among them those who are sanctified by faith in me. Paul had a message and the message was this. You are going to go out and you're going to take everything you learned in your life. When you were a Pharisee and a religious teacher, you knew the Bible. At some point, you inherited Roman citizenship. That will prepare you for your ministry in life. You have seen me the risen Lord, you have the power of the Holy Spirit. You have gone through all these things to prepare you. You've been in the process, now trust the process. Get up and go. Your ministry is not going to be a ministry to Jerusalem. It's going to be to the Gentiles in the world because only the Jews hang around here. Some are spread out. They're called the Diaspora. They're not a whole lot of them, but most are here in Jerusalem. You're going to be the one to take the baton and go to the ends of the earth, and we are here because he obeyed his message. Amen. We, he obeyed his message. Let me ask you something. Do you have a message? Do you have a message? I've got a message. Let me tell you something, okay? I got a message. I thank God no one invited me to church when I was a kid. I thank God my parents never took me to church. You want to know why? Because I had to have a Saul to Paul conversion where God got me in the darkest of times. Because I was a grown man. And I looked around at religion. I looked at every church. I went everywhere that I heard. I engaged in every conversation. People getting high and talking about God. Ooh, he's in the tree. Okay, like I have been there, done that. Always wanted God in my life. And then he revealed himself as Jesus Christ. And I was ready to go. But see, I was an older man. I had some wisdom to me. And I looked around and I saw this. Christians don't like each other. Even though the Bible says we're better together. Even though the, the call of a pastor is not to go visit some old person at a house. That's not their job. It's to keep the unity of saints. It's to equip the saints for works of service. That's the call of a shepherd. That's what we're called to do. We're called to do that. And I look at this and I felt that call. And I looked at the state of the church. I'm not talking about our church. I'm talking about the church, okay? And I saw so much potential I felt like everybody wanted to play together. They just didn't know how. You ever felt that way? Oh, see, actually, your heads are nodded. 
And I'm a grown up, so I'm like, I'm gonna figure this thing out. And you know what it got to? I wasn't going to change every church I walked to. I can't do that. I can't change a heart. The Holy Spirit can. But I'll do this. I will be obedient to the first thing God put on my heart. If I have a restlessness in my heart about something, I'm gonna seek Him and I am going to change it by the power of the Holy Spirit. And so praying, seeking God, experiences, I'll tell you this, brothers and sisters, God put a burden on my heart to influence the church. Influence, not change it, not yell at it, not scream about it, not be nasty about it, but to influence it. Because I have to get the leadership. And then I started going, well, how would you influence the church? Well, I looked at the other gifts that God gave me so graciously. He gave me two other gifts. He gave me one to evangelize. Now, evangelize is going out and finding the lost, okay? I think most of you know I would rather hang with lost people than sanctified people. And if you're a lost person that doesn't know what's sanctified, I'm so glad you're here. It's a church word. Praise the Lord. <laughs> And then there's the other. I know a lot about the Bible. I actually like to teach it. But sometimes people are like, Ben's a little fluffy. Well, you got to learn to balance say, you know, the most sanctified and the most infant. It's the hardest thing I've ever had to do. How do you teach people the word of God? I just have to hope it goes out and remind people it's not my job to feed you. It's to equip you to feed yourself. Now, I had that ability. I just taught you something, truth. I have this heart to influence the church. I have a burden. And then I have a gift to go out and share the gospel. And then I have another gift that wants to raise the willing. If you're willing to grow in the Lord, I don't care where you're at. I don't care what sin you're in. I don't care what state you live in. I don't care what gender you are, what color you are. I don't care who you vote for. If you want to grow in Christ, come on and be with me. That's who I want to be with. And it makes so much sense. But I had to seek God about this for years, that my burden, just like Paul's, was to the Gentiles. Yes, he'd go to the Jews, but the Jews wouldn't listen. And he even tells them that. The Jews aren't going to listen to you. I'm going to have to rescue them for you. You're going to go to the non-Jews. And just like he gives them that message, I feel like God gave me a message. That message is to influence the church by reaching lost people and raising up the willing. That's what I want to do. And if you sit in a pew, I don't hate you. I pray to help you. But the Lord our God has not called anyone. He has not saved a soul to sit. We need each other. And I find that amazing. You've got to ask yourself, what's your message? Are you passionate about numbers? Go be the most godly accountant you have in the name of Christ. Are you passionate about children? I am not. I love my kids, but I got, you know, like the, you know. Cassie's on vacation, and immediately people start texting and bowing out. Volunteers, I can't be there. I can't be there. I'm like, who do I call? Does she deal with this every day? Hello, people online. Cassie, if you're watching, type in and let me know. Does that happen all the time? Please don't bail on her. I don't know your number to call. I don't know what to do. I don't have a burden for that. I don't have a burden for youth. I can't imagine what Pastor Nathan, does he not do a great job or what? I can't imagine what he's going to do next Saturday because I had to do that for four or five years. And I'll tell you what, that's probably why I got back and shoulder problems. Kids are terrible people. <laughs> I'll take 40 and broken over a teenager any day of the week. But Nate's got a passion. If your passion runs through politics, then go politic in the name of Jesus Christ. If your passion runs for, I don't know, you know, people who live under a bridge, go find the people under the bridge. Find out what your gifts are. Find out what your target is and go and do it. Look what Paul does. Remember, he goes to two places. He's in Damascus and then he's in Syria. Check out this, okay? Look what Paul does. I love this. So after taking some food, so Paul gets the scales off of his eyes. He's sitting there on the bed. He's like, what do I do now? Eat. So then he says, after he takes some food, he regained his strength. And Saul spent several days with the disciples in where? Damascus. At, what does it say? At once. Everybody says, well, at once. 
At once, he began to preach in the synagogue that Jesus is the Son of God. He didn't go, wait, I got to go through a catechism. Hey, wait, I got to go through this, you know, Stephen's ministry thing. Hey, wait, I got to go to Bible study for three years before I could even go out. No, he saw everything in his past. And he realized it was a process. And he was rearing to go. I love that. At once. If you can find your message, now your message is Jesus Christ risen from the dead, okay? That's the message. But you can find your passion. You will go at once. You will go at once. And you might ask yourselves, you know, you'll be like, well, I don't want to. That's the best time to step up and do it. That's the best time to get up and move is when you don't want to. It's when you don't want to because you want to know why? God knows your heart. God knows your weaknesses. God knows when your heart is saying, I don't want to do it. And he said, I'm going to do it through you anyway. So just pick them up and put them down and keep going. And then when he gets out and he goes down to Jerusalem, hey, Jerusalem's his hometown. These are his homies. He should be hooking up with everybody, right? And he says, all right, so he goes down and says, so Saul stayed with them. So he's talking to the apostle, the church people. Anybody know some church people? If you got your hand down, you're a church person. All right, so he says, so Saul stayed with them and moved about freely in Jerusalem, speaking boldly. Everybody say boldly. Boldly in the name of the Lord. He talked and debated with the Hellenistic Jews, but they tried to kill him. He had a message. And here, if you read and pay attention to the history, this is the nerd part. Where did he start? In Damascus. Not Israel, not Jewish. He was with Diaspora is the word, okay? He is with Grecian Jews. This would be a Gentile area. And then finally when he gets to Jerusalem and he knows everybody, he's speaking to them. He's speaking his message where he's going, but who's he speaking to in Jerusalem? The Hellenistic Jews, the Greek Jews, the Gentile Jews. They're converted. Remember those people we talked about a few months or a few weeks ago? They're the ones that killed Stephen. And he walks in there what? Boldly. Boldly. Now stop and think about it. What do you do boldly in the name of Jesus? Cody, you do a lot of bold things in the name of Jesus. This kid shows up every week. He, he interns for free, and he does all this amazing stuff for us. Graphics, print, all these things, and he does it for free. I love internships. Just send your teenagers for that thing. But <laughs> he gets up, and he does it in the name of the Lord. You don't have to get up and be a preacher. You don't have to get up and know the Bible back and forth. You have to know this. You went through a process, and trust the process, because God brought you here to develop your message in the name of Jesus. He didn't go out and say... You know, Jesus, I think he said, you know, be nice to others. He didn't say that. He said love others. Loving others and being nice to others is something completely different. I heard a good quote the other day. If you show grace and don't give truth, it's the cruelest thing you'll ever do because it leaves you in sin. It's the cruelest thing you could ever do. But I don't want to digress. I don't care if your passion is children, grandparents, elderly, shut-ins, uh, people with HIV, uh, I, Democrats, Republicans, and you think you have to fix these other, fine, but go out in the name of Jesus and learn to do it in love and truth. Find your message. If you're passionate about cutting the grass, cut the grass in the name of Jesus. If you're passionate about painting, paint in the name of Jesus. If you're passionate about marriages, do it in the name of Jesus. Go. I am telling you, if you were called and if you were respond, God gave you a message to share the gospel and to a people to share it to. Amen. Amen. And if you don't know that call, hey, don't feel bad. Trust the process. Start asking God, why is this happening in my life? What are you preparing me for? You know, I didn't want to go, oh, we lost a child. I didn't rejoice. I cried and felt guilty. I didn't want a second back surgery. It just made me angry. I didn't want two shoulder surgeries because I'm too dumb to be, you know, because I'm 100% in, if you can't tell, on anything at the gym. But I trust the process. I know my message. And I don't wait around to share it because people are going to hell 
or people are dying on the vine. It's that simple. And I choose to influence the church by reaching the lost and raising the willing. Paul chooses to go out and be obedient to God and share the gospel in Jerusalem, get kicked out, and ultimately be a light to the nations by being a minister to the Gentiles. And if you can just ask yourself, what am I most passionate about? What's that one thing? Just go do it in the name of Jesus and watch what happens because the name of Jesus is mighty. Amen? Amen? Trust your message. If God called you, he handed you a message. If you don't know, that's okay. Start showing, ask me, seek. What gifts did you give me to accomplish this mission? He gave it to you. And hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me, hear me. me. Look right here. I need you to do it. We need you to do it. Whatever your message is, whatever he's moving along in the process, I believe with all my heart he's getting you ready to do something bigger and better than you ever could believe. But you got to get up and go you got to get up and go. You go, all right, well, you know, Ben, uh, Saul had all this, uh, you know, knowledge and he had all this stuff, so it was pretty easy for him to go. And I would go, yeah, you know, it kind of was. But guess what? People didn't like him. Did you catch what was happening in these two stories? Both times, in Damascus and at his home, people wanted to what? Kill him. Not, Not that I shame him. Not like give him a dirty look at the gas station, have that awkward moment of that person that you don't like, you know, it's like, you know, where you pick up your phone and act like you're talking or texting or something like that. Not that type of, (laughs) they wanted to kill him. You need to remember the radical message of what he's saying. He is saying that Jesus you crucified literally rose from the dead and his name has power. And they're going, no. But some people came anyway. And if you're going to go out and na- trust in your message, you need to trust in your friends. You need to trust in your community that you have. I mean, check this out, all right? Small sent several days with the disciples in Damascus. So he's got some disciples. And it says, but Saul learned of their plan. Day and night they kept close watch on the city gates in order to kill him. Try to kill Saul. But, everybody say but, but. His followers took him by night and lowered him in a basket through the opening in the wall. Then when he goes down, all the way down to Jerusalem, he's like, my hometown. He goes right to the church people, Heisman pose. And then all of a sudden, the saint of saints, Barnabas, whose word, you know, his name means encourager. He walks in because he's got such a good name. And But Barnabas took him, we're talking about Saul, and brought him to the apostles. He told them how Saul on his journey had seen the Lord and that the Lord had spoken to him. And how in Damascus he preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus. And when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and they sent him off to Tarsus. Okay, so now I want you to understand You've got a message, and you've got to go out, and you have to trust in your message. That means you have to trust Jesus. Jesus is truth. You have to trust him in your message. But listen, people are going to fight against you in the process. Your body is going to break down. People are going to say nice or bad things about you on social media. People are going to come at you cowardly. They're going to come behind your back. They're going to kick it. This is happening here. They're going to kick your door in in your office and start screaming at you and not even know that what they're talking about is completely wrong. When you are doing something right, understand this. There's evil coming at you. And that's where a lot of us feel. That weight is so heavy we could never find joy in our life now or ever again. But this is why I keep telling you, you've got to remember, you've got to trust your message. You've got to trust the Spirit in you. And I have never seen in the Bible, nor have I ever seen in my life, a Christian that was effective on their own. I have never seen a Christian that's been effective on their own. Not once. We need each other. If you stop and you think back at the most joyful, godly people in your life, no matter how old they are, how young they are, I don't, I don't really care. Do you ever notice they got a, a, you know, a group around them? Do you ever notice they got people that breathe life into them? Listen to me very carefully, okay? You hear it, I'm going to admit it. The hardest job in the world, I believe, well, not hard, I definitely won, is my job. Who am I going to tell my secrets to? Who am I going to tell my hurts to? 
I can't do it. I can't do it. Can't tell my wife. I got to be my wife's pastor. We serve communion at home sometimes. No, we <laughs> People sometimes think like pastors like glow in the dark. Ooh, you know what I mean? Like, but I've, okay, like I have to have people in my life. See, if I can't fully give myself over to somebody, that means I need a lot of somebodies to come be with me so they can take a piece because I am not going to go alone because I know this. The times I've gone alone in my faith, it has all fallen apart. It is all falling apart. And I wish to God that somebody will grab you today and say, come with me. Nine times out of ten, that doesn't happen. I, everybody in here who's got a call should run and grab somebody else and say, come with me. Just like Jesus walked by the disciples and they were casting nets right at the very beginning. And what do you say? Follow me. And they followed. And the world was changed. And I'm telling you, if you continue to own your message and you have people that have true community in your life, whether you're at Sunday school, in a life group, or in an act of, you're, ooh, you know where some of the best times you meet people? Is when you're actually ministering. Do you want to know? I got the best gift in the world next to salvation when I was a volunteer 17 and a half years ago. I met my wife. I met my wife volunteering for Jesus. And I wasn't looking for a girl. I didn't know how to treat girls. I actually, you know, Heisman poster. I think I'm told you that's right. I want to be with her. But she was so hot, I, mean, I just gave in. <laughs> I just gave in. Best thing that ever happened to me. And you know what? She still walks with me today. She tells me when I'm wrong, but she encourages me when I'm right. She prays for me. She takes care of the home. She does all these things. And I wouldn't be who I am without her. But I can't tell her some things. I can't. Do you see how it would taint her view? I mean, if somebody came in here and told me your secrets, which I know a lot of them, what if I told my wife? You'd be like, oh, don't we? <laughs> no. Yeah. And it's not that your secrets are a problem. I want to carry them. That's my job. Take, you know, keep giving them to me. I'll carry it for you because I want to be a part of the process. We need each other to be part of the process. You can't just have a pastor. You need each other. That's right. That's right. Amen. You cannot just do it with me. You need to do it together. The best, uh, the, the most fun ministry I was ever a part of was when I did uh, sunrise camps and, uh, for Bethesda, the old ministry I worked in. And um, I, just a quick, quick, quick background on what that was, okay? It was for adults with intellectual and developmental disabilities, and they'd come to camp. And if they came to camp, there was a teenager that was partnered with them, and they'd spend an entire week together. They'd go around, they'd do things together, and the kids, the teens would learn every single time. They're not ministering to a poor, pitied person, but God is using them to change their life, part, to be part of their process. I saw it year after year, camp after camp. And there were two kids from this church that would come all the time. They were like your backups, you know, like we couldn't get a volunteer. Like, come on now. One of them was Kyle Colson, okay? If anybody knows Kyle, he's a Marine right now. And Kyle would come down and he'd be there. And this dude, I mean, he deserves like a sports drink and a medal every time he's there. He had every person you can find. Well, he had, there was these two brothers and one's name was Matt. And Matt liked rocks. And everywhere Kyle went, he had to be with him at the hip, everywhere for a week. And all Matt wanted to do was find rocks. Now he wasn't into like quartz or you know whatever. It was. it was just rocks. And he started going, he carried rocks. Finally he had to get, you know, Kyle a little wheelbarrow <laughs> carrying the rocks. So it's about the third or fourth day, and he's walking down the, this water path, and all of a sudden Matt goes, I want that rock. Now this rock happened to be in the deepest part of the water. And it's not like he could just reach in and pull it. And Kyle is sweaty. He's dirty. And Kyle's like, you know what? I'm just, I'm dunzy. And he gets in and this mushy stuff and he gets the rock. He puts the rock in. They go up and then they come to lunch. So they pray, they worship, they go eat lunch. Then everybody takes a nap. But the volunteers, we go to this, this other time, we talk about how God was taking them through a process to change their lives through a person with a disability. So people are sharing these stories. And I mean, they were the best stories in the world. And finally, it gets to Kyle. I always, Kyle was so reflective. But he was so deep. The spirit was just upon that young man. And he stopped and he told the story about, he's like, you you know what? I couldn't imagine not getting the rock from Matt. And when he told that story, 
instead of crying tears of passion, I had to hold back laughter because he got in the sewage. It wasn't a creek. <laughs> and we had to remove him. <laughs> and we had to clean him. And we laughed about it the whole way. And Kyle was getting out, and I'm like, man, you okay with this? He's like, I'd do it again. I'd do it again, because Matt changed my life. Matt's got a message. Kyle's got a message. Each message is a little bit different. But you're not going to carry your message alone. It's not going to happen. The disciples in Damascus had to lower Paul down through a wall. Let me ask you something. Do you know somebody with a basket big enough to lower you? Do you know somebody strong enough to lower you? Do you know somebody who would stay up all night watching those who would kill to sneak you out? Do you have a Barnabas that knows the right people, even though the right people don't want to know you, that will fight for you in all occasions? Do you have that? Because if you don't, walk out of here and just ask Sheena. It's that easy. We'll put you together. Your life was not meant to be alone, and it certainly wasn't just meant for me, me, me and Kristen to be. Because if you're married, you're one. And so we're one. I need two. You know what I mean? we got to connect together. It doesn't work if, it, if you don't work it. Because this is what? A process. So this whole time, okay, this whole time, Saul, from the very beginning, trusts his message, even though it rattles people and causes him death. But he trusts his message anyway because he's so passionate about it. He can't get it out of him. He trusts the message in a Gentile area, and he trusts the message to Gentile Jews. It's literary irony. And most people didn't want to hear it to the point that they wanted to kill him. To the point they wanted to kill him. And so, finally, even though he trusts the message, even though he trusts his friends, what does it say to do? It says, then they sent him away. They sent him away. When it said he had preached fearlessly in the name of Jesus, when the believers learned of this, they took him down to Caesarea and sent him off to Tarsus. Now, I want you to catch the last verse, because verse 31 would literally, if I was Saul, Paul, it would ruin my life, okay? It truly would. Because you have just got to learn when you are speaking the word and you have got people around you to cheer you on when you aren't strong. You're working the process. And then sometimes when you're working the process, listen to me, this is what I, what I learned and I believe the Spirit is put in my heart. When it is darkest, when you fear the most, when life is hardest, and it feels like you will never, ever, ever obtain what God put on your heart, that's when you're in the right place. Because he's pushed, and he's pushed, and he's pushed. And then he goes away. And verse 31 says, after he sailed away to Tarsus. Tarsus is his home. Okay? It says then. Everybody say then. Then, which means after Paul, since after Paul's chaos, it says then. The church throughout Judea, Galilee, and Samaria enjoyed a time of peace and was strengthened. Living in fear of the Lord and encouraged by the Holy Spirit, it increased in what? Numbers. Do you not think as Paul is sailing away, the church is getting happier and happier, and they're having a revival, and all of a sudden people are running around and they're saying, yeah, praise God. People, are, people, are saying, so people who can't play music are just like, yeah, we're rocking. We're going. We're ready to go. And what boggles my mind and what I love about the Bible is this. Paul didn't sit there and say, what if? As he's walking away and things are getting better. And he's sailing off to Tarsus and people are posting on, you know, whatever Instagram they had. And they hear it's growing and things are good. And you go, so it was bad when I was there and it's good when I'm gone. Do you not think at that darkest moment he would have given up? Do you not think for one second he would have said, well, what if, I, what if I used this 
verse? What if I would have said it with this tone? What if I would have said it with these people? Would it have been better? Would it have been better? You ever lived your life like that? What if I didn't go there? What if I didn't do that? What if I didn't marry this person? What if I didn't say this thing? What if, what if, what if, instead of looking back and saying, he did, he did, he did, he did. It's a mindset. It's a mindset. Everything about this passage is Paul or Saul, I believe, trusting the process. He's trusting that God is going to work without him. But he's preparing him for what? What did he tell Paul at the very beginning? You're going to go to the synagogues and they ain't going to like you. And you're going to go to the Jews and be a, so they can be a light, or the Gentiles, I'm sorry, and be a light to the nations. You obey, the results will come from me. He didn't live in a world of what ifs. Do some of you not just look back and say what if? What if do some of you look forward and say what if? What if I paid this bill off? What if I, you know, had this friend? What if I got smarter about this? What if, what if, what if? Stop saying what if and say he is. Jesus said he would be with you always to the end of days. In the Old Testament, in the New Testament, God said, I will never leave you or forsake you. He has been there in the bad, working it out for good so you can go forward and continue to share your message with your team because you trust the process and you'll see in the next 20 chapters of Acts, Paul changes the world. And every single person in this room, I believe with all of my heart, if I trust my message to influence the church by reaching the lost and raising the willing, and Ken trusts his, and Terry trusts his, and Tron trusts his, Ron trusts his, we will see God do more. That's what I want to see. Do you want to see it? Then remember this proverb. Proverbs 5. Or three, verse five and six. Everybody knows it. It's on every crocheted thing in the world. But it's God's living word. Trust in the Lord with what? All your heart. And lean not what? On your understanding. And all your ways submit to him. And he will make your paths straight. Now listen, listen, listen. He'll make your paths straight. What does that mean? He gave you a path to walk. Walk that path. Trust in him as you pick him up and put him down. Share your message. Make some friends and watch God do immeasurably more than we could ask or what? Imagine. Thank you for tuning in. Please join us for next week's podcast.